this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Amen. Now, as we're looking here in this passage out of you know, Thessalonians this morning, this is going to kind of be a continuation from, you know, last week we were talking about, you know, some of the things of the condition of, you know, the world. We looked at some of the numbers that, you know, might have, sound, might have looked a little discouraging of, you know, the, the rejection that people have for the things of God. And, and it should never be a thing of that. It should be, you know, dis, you know, so discouraging for us that we don't want to continue to preach the word because we can see the effect that it has on individuals. And this morning, we're, we're going to see this church in Thessalonica, the effect that the word of God had in them. And Paul starts out here in this passage talking about and he says, for verily when we were with you. And he's talking about the time that he spent with this church. And when we, I want us to just spend a moment looking actually at the time that he spent with them. I'll go back to the book of Acts and go to chapter 17. Here in Acts chapter 17, we're going to start at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, we see here they go to Thessalonica. And how long was it that Paul was there preaching to them? Three Sabbath days. Three weeks. He's there for a span of three weeks. And it says he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. He's teaching them things during this time frame out of the scriptures. And you see that there are some who are receiving what he's saying, and there are some who don't receive what he's saying. Now, this pattern of what he's doing, you see him do this in the book of Acts. Each time he goes into a city, he goes and he teaches, and he teaches out of the scriptures. Some receive it, and some don't. And when 
he talks about those that receive it. I want to go back to you know, 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to chapter 2 now. And, now this is a verse that you know, we've read you know, a few different times in, in, you know, various, you know, in various messages. But you see how Paul describes this church talking about their how they received him in verse 13 of chapter 2. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And he's thanking God for the fact that he went in, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, and they're taking what he's teaching and they're receiving it as the word of God. You know, and it's the word of God which he says at the end of this passage, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And we talked about this in you know, a little bit during the Sunday school this morning about how the Word of God doesn't have an impact on a person until they believe the Gospel. Once a person puts their trust in the fact that Christ died for their sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, when a person puts their trust in that gospel, then the word of God can have an effect on them. Amen. Until that point when they accept that gospel, they can read the word of God over and over again, and it's not going to have the same impact that it would on a believer. It's not actually working in them. And Paul's not saying here that... You know, we're getting all the glory out of this. His thing is, we thank God. He was thanking God for the fact that they were receiving this as the Word of God. Not as what men were saying, but the instructions that God was giving to them. And that the Word of God was having an impact, an impact to where he could describe it. If we go back up to chapter 1, and you see verse 3, as he's talking about this church, he says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And as he describes them here, you see this thing of he's remembering their work of faith, so he sees their faith, their labor of love, he sees their love, and their patience of hope, he sees their hope. Now, remember back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there was some things that were going to cease, and there were some things that were going to abide. The sign gifts were going to cease. And the things that we're going to abide are faith, hope, and charity. What is he seeing here in the Thessalonian church? Their faith, their hope, and their love. He's seeing the outworking of the Word of God in them. He's seeing it having that impact on their life. So when he can describe this here in ver back in our text in verse 4, it's like, oh, when we were with you, he knows the foundation that they have. That they have a foundation of understanding that the Word of God has come to them and has taken root in them and is having an impact on their lives. And then he can say the thing of, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation 
even as it came to pass in Enoch. So they have a foundation, and he's saying, we told you we should suffer tribulation. We were going to suffer something that happens. Now, when we see that word tribulation, the one thing I want to stress with this is because this word has be become synonymous with something. And people say, well, talking about the day of the Lord. Well, the day of the Lord is not the tribulation that Paul is talking about here. The day of the Lord is God's wrath being poured out on this world. In chapter 1, Paul says in verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We're delivered from the wrath of God. That's such a glorious thing to think about that we're not going to face the wrath of God. That's why he, he can start all of his epistles when you look in verse 1, you know, when he says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't deserve peace with God. We deserved wrath because of the issue of sin. Through His grace, God takes care of the issue of sin. And when He takes care of the issue of sin, the issue of wrath is gone away. The only thing that can be there for us as members of the body of Christ is peace with God because the sin issue is taken away. And one of the hymns that we open with, you know, the second stanza begins with, I am so wondrously saved from sin. That is a wondrous thing to be saved from sin and to have the peace with God to where we're not going to face His wrath being poured out upon us. But yet Paul says we're going to face tribulation. We're going to face problems. There are things that are going to happen to us while we're here on planet Earth because we're living in a fleshly body. We're living in a sin-cursed world. There are problems we're going to face. And Paul's saying here that, you know, in our text, that we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Individuals teach that a believer should be protected from the problems of this world. God doesn't promise us that in this dispensation. He tells us things like we should suffer tribulation. He says things, let's go over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians from chapter number 1, read here verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, 
but also to suffer for his sake. We're told that we're going to suffer. It's a promise that's been made towards us. We go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And as much as people you know, probably wish that this verse would, but wasn't written in the Bible to say that we're, we're promised to suffer, <laughs> this one's even more that people can say, man, I wish, I wish God wouldn't have included this uh, in the Scripture. When he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All those who are living godly in Christ Jesus. Now, the question is, who is it that's those that are living godly in Christ Jesus? It's everyone who's a member of the body of Christ. It's a promise made to us that we're going to suffer tribulation, we're going to have sufferings, we're going to have persecution is going to happen on us. And it starts all the way back with the salvation of the Apostle Paul. Let's go back to Acts chapter number 9. Skip down to a discussion between God and Ananias here, you know, where God's telling Ananias that Saul of Tarsus is coming. And Ananias is like, you know, I've I've heard of all these bad things that he's done. You know, why you know why are you sending him to me? We well, see God's answer. We're gonna read verses 15 and 16 of chapter 9. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul was going to suffer things. And when you see the list of the things that Paul suffered, and Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's, Paul's ministry wasn't you know, sunshine and lollipops and rainbows and all these you know, nice, easy things in his life. Paul, here in 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, I the ministers of Christ, I speak as a fool, I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I'm tired just reading that list. <laughs> but you read that and you see a thing of that. It seems like every day of Paul's ministry, there was a new problem that was coming up. And he was 
facing all of these things. And, you know, many things that, you know, I know today, you know, if I was facing half of that list, I'd be thinking twice about the path of you know, what I'm doing here on you know, why all of this is happening. Paul's going through all of these things knowing that he's been told he was going to have to suffer for his sake. And he goes through all of these different things. And he goes through because he knows God has given answers for him on how to be able to deal with these situations. I'm going to go over to chapter 4. Say in 2 Corinthians, let's go to chapter 4. And as we read these verses, just keep in mind that list of things that the Apostle Paul had recorded in chapter 11. But here in chapter 4, we read verses 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, that whole list of all those things that the Apostle Paul said he suffered through, and here in chapter 4, he says, our light affliction. The unsaved person would look at that list and go, how can, how can anyone say that all of those things are a light affliction? The Apostle Paul, inspired by God, records that those things are a light affliction. And he's realizing that I'm going through these things and it's working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Because the focus is not on the things of this world. The focus is on the things in heavenly places. That's why you know, our promise, you know, when you talk about the body of Christ, our promise is that we've been given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Our conversation you know, our focus, our lives are supposed to be focused on the things in the heavenly places. We're not to be in, you know, tied up in the things of this world. So you know, when we're not tied up in the things of this world, we look at these problems that are going on, it can be a light affliction. Because the things that are going on, they have an act. Thank you. Does the idea of an exceeding and eternal weight of glory have an end? No. no. That's why the promise of the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Amen. We're given a gift of eternal, a life that we're going to live with Him for all of eternity where we're going to have an exceeding and eternal weight of glory waiting for us. When we think about things in that light, it's easy to kind of say, well, you know what? Eh, this thing, you know, is it bad right now? Yeah. Eh. Is it going to get better? Yeah. Is it going to be much better for us in all of eternity? Yes. And when we can get our focus to shift on that, then we can have, when Paul's you know, talking about, he, he goes into chapter 1, it talks about how blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. 
our comfort comes from we're reading these things in the Word of God and understanding what the Word's telling us, and it gives us the comfort to, go, to be able to deal with those things. You know, that's what, when you, you know, we're studying out of 1 you know, Thessalonians today, you know, in chapter 4, there's a passage that des you know, describes the event that's called the rapture. And it talks about how that event, you know, talking about it, is a comfort to those who've had someone who's died. You know, the comfort comes from the fact that you know, we know we're going to see that person again. We know that there's going to be a point in time when we're going to be caught up in the air and we're going to, and we're going to see those people again for all of eternity. That's a comfort. That's why Paul is saying about comfort one another with these words. And it's the Word of God that's giving that comfort. So when he's telling, let's go back to our text, in 1 Thessalonians. He has explained to them these things. They have the Word of God working in them. And then in verse 5, he talks about this issue. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. He sends... He sends Timothy unto them to really, in a sense, he's making sure they're grounded in the faith. He's making, you know, he knows that they have received the word of God. He knows that you know, Romans chapter 10, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, that they have their faith. But he's sending to make sure that they are staying rooted in the faith that they have. Because the Word of God does work and build people up. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. First Corinthians chapter number 3. And we're going to start here at verse number 6. And here's Paul saying, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And here he is talking about the process that the Word of God has. And he's saying, and you know, Paul's saying, I have planted. He gave them information. And it says, Apollos water. You know, Apollos is teaching them and edifying them and building them up in the doctrine. But who's giving the increase? God. God's giving the increase because it's the Spirit, one part of the Godhead, that's teaching the individual and giving them the increase in the knowledge of God's Word. So God's giving the increase, and if God's giving the increase, it's God who's getting the glory. And Paul is you know, going, shocking on their faith because he knows that there's an issue that's coming up of where, and I'm going to read in our text, he says, Thus by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. That there's a tempter that's going to tempt someone and take them away from the truth of the Word of God.
Now that tempter that's Satan who's functioning as a tempter to people today. And one of the things we saw last week was, you know, the number of people who believe that Satan's you know, Satan's just a description of all that's evil in the world and isn't and isn't a real individual. The scriptures, you know, here we have Paul calling them the tempter, tempting individuals. He talks about the ministry that Satan has. We'll go to back to 2 Corinthians 11. We were there a few minutes ago. But I want to go back there now because Paul's going to talk about some things related to how this works. And here in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, we're going to read verses 3 and 4 here first. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not, we have not preached, or if you or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And we see this thing of beguile. You know, the serpent beguiled Eve. Now, what does the word beguile mean? He deceived or tricked Eve through his subtlety. All he had to do was hath God said. He just asks a question related to what did God say? And all Steve had to do was say exactly what God had said. Instead, she couldn't say exactly what God had said. And the moment she didn't say exactly to what God said, well, okay, you, well, you didn't you didn't quote it quite properly, so now I can go in and I can subtly, uh, subtly suggest, well, huh, you're not really going to die. Uh, you know, uh, and just that very subtle thing tempted Eve to disobey God's word. And sometimes we, you know, people think of and the teaching that comes around is that. Satan's an idiot. You know, he's not. You know, he, he has wisdom. He has an understanding of God's word to the point of where he can trick and be subtle to use the word of God. And verse 4 gives the examples when it talks about another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Now, those the idea of another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, it's using God's word, hmm. not rightly divided. Thank you. There's a, there's a Jesus preached according to the prophetic program, and there's Jesus Christ preached according to the mystery. Paul talks about Jesus preached according to the mystery. The gospels teach Jesus according to prophecy. Now, which one are we supposed to be following? Mystery or prophecy? We're supposed to be following Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Another spirit. There's the spirit in Acts 2 that bestows the sign gifts. There's the spirit that functions in Ephesians 1, that seals us and keeps us in the body. That you know, we're baptized by, you know, by the Spirit. You know, 
1 Corinthians chapter 12. Which presentation of the Spirit are we following? Another gospel. Repent and be baptized or remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures. Which gospel are you following? Now, all of these are coming from Scripture. You know, none of this is you know, someone just coming up with some wild thought process because most people can see through those things. Most people can see through things like you know, Scientology because you know, it has nothing to do with God's Word. But when you start bringing God's Word into it, well, it's, you know, if you're saying the Gospels in 1 Corinthians 15, I can show you where they're, you know, that's not really the Gospel. I can pull scripture out. That's what Satan's doing. He's beguiling. He's subtly using scripture to deceive individuals. That's why the description of him in verse, go down to verses, you know, starting in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. All of this is to appear as ministers of righteousness. Because it's the word of God that's being used. It's the word of God, either not divided or wrongly divided, but it's the word of God that's being used to subtly draw someone away. It's why the Apostle Paul can describe this. We'll go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And as he's writing this last epistle to the apostle to Timothy, he's going to describe something here in this passage, talking about the role that the servant of the Lord should have. We'll start in verse 24 here of 2 Timothy 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle all, unto all men, apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, so God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That there are individuals who are going to be caught in the snare. They're going to be caught in the trap of the beguilement, the subtleness, the appearing as ministers of righteousness. And he's talking, you know, the individuals who are caught in a snare, is this a saved person or is this an unsaved person that would be caught in a snare? It's a saved person who's caught up in this snare. Amen. Who's been taken captive by the false doctrine that's being taught. And when I say false doctrine, I'm defining it as doctrine that doesn't apply to us in this dispensation. Because the snare is things of, yeah, it's things out of the Word of God. Or it appears that it's coming from the Word of God. And that, well, you know, well, there's that verse in well, yeah, I think it kind of means eh, this, and then all of a sudden the person's caught in that snare. 
Satan works by trying to attack the message of God's word rightly divided. He tries to get this message from and keep it from going out. He can either keep it from going out by stopping, well, that's really not what the word of God is saying, taking someone away from that, or attacking the messenger themselves. You know, to try to pull them away from God's word. You know, we said about you know, getting someone being caught up in things in this world and taking them away from studying and administering God's word. Everything is trying to take things away from the effectiveness that the body of Christ has. The body of Christ is effective when it's following the doctrine that's given in Romans through Philemon, standing for the word of God rightly divided, studying and ministering this world, this word to this lost and dying world. That's when the body of Christ is effective. It's not effective when it starts getting away from those things. When it starts being pulled away, and Paul is saying that there are those who are taken captive. And he says in this text, he's talking about the servant of the Lord and saying about how the person, the person who's described as that servant is to try to help recover that person out of that. It's like about not striving, being gentle, being apt to teach, being patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That's the way that a person is, take, is helping someone to recover them out of that trap. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not a thing of, okay, you know, when he says, must not strive, that's the idea, you know, striving is that idea of trying to, you know, fight about things. You know, if, you know, if I find someone who's caught in that snare, and I'm not doing these things that Paul's instructing here, and I'm trying to recover them in any other way than this, am I going to be effective recovering them out of that snare? No. That's why you know, he, he's, he's saying about well, in meekness, and you know, Minister Rondell talked about that a few weeks ago, about that idea of a person using, you know, doing it in that meek spirit. We, and we looked at passages you know, out of Titus. I want, I want to actually go to Titus for a moment here because this is what, if he had found the problem there and found, in the church in Thessalonica. The issue would have been, and why go to chapter 2, we're going to read verse 1. It says, But speak thou to things which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is what's needed. That's why the instruction in, in, in 2 Timothy is, you know, the idea of holding, holding fast the form of sound words. That's what, I think, because it's the Word of God which is going to have the impact. That's why even when you look at the armor of God that the Apostle Paul describes in Ephesians 6, we're fighting a spiritual warfare. We're for, in the spiritual warfare we're fighting is against Satan and his angels. And he lays out all of this armor that we put on to protect ourselves and then the last piece of that armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The only offensive weapon we're given is the Word of God. We're not given anything else to fight this warfare. We're given God's Word. During the you know, Sunday school pastor Rita quoted Hebrews chapter 4, talking about the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
It's the word of God which is going to be able to recover someone from them. That's why Paul's going and looking at them and trying to find out where they're, what faith do they have? Do they have faith in what God's word is saying? Because if they have that faith, are they going to fall into this trap that Satan would have for them? No. If they're understanding God's word rightly divided, putting their faith in God's word, and, and Satan or one of the ministers of righteousness is coming and saying, well, you know, you're wrong. You know, you know, I'll pick on Jack. <sighs> if someone walks up to Jack and says, well, you know, Jack, I've heard what you're saying, but, you know, to give, you know, God's still giving a prophecy today, and the gift of prophecy is still in effect. Hopefully, Jack's going to have the answer out of God's word, and is going to say that, you know, well, you know, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, and we're going to, you know, I can show you how it talks about that, you know, pro you know prophecy's going to cease. Now, if Jack just starts screaming at the person, you know, not that Jack would, I think, would ever start screaming at anyone, but if Jack just starts scre screaming at them, saying, I can't believe you believe that, and just yelling, and you know, and the person can see that he's getting so visibly upset by them, and, you know, and as Jack's getting visibly upset, drifting away from using God's word into it becoming more of an emotional argument at that point, is the person even going to hear God's word in God? And to have that word of God hopefully have that impact on them. Now it's always up to the individual to you know, have that, you know, if it's going to have that impact or not. But we, if we're, perform, if we're functioning properly, we're going to be doing it in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Mm. You know, it's why Paul had, you know, is looking at these things to see what it is that's abiding in them. He's testing them. We're in Titus. We'll go to chapter 2, in which we are, because the thing of when he says in verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us to denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It's the grace of God that's going to teach all of those things. It's the grace of God that's going to keep us where we're at. To, not to do the wrong things. To tell us how to do the right things. It's going to give us the doctrine that we need to live our lives. But when we go back to our text in 1 Thessalonians, then read verse 6, where Paul's saying, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remember, remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. And he's saying, you know, Timothy came to you, he's, and he brought us good tidings of this is what they were doing. He saw the faith and charity that they had, that they had the good remembrance of Paul and the doctrine they had been given. And for Paul, in verse 7, it says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress, by your faith. It should be a comfort for us to know that not only are there people in the Western York region that understand God's word rightly divided, but that there are people all across the United States that understand God's word rightly divided, and people all over the world that understand the truth of God's word rightly divided. And knowing that there are others who are out there who are taking the same stand as us, fighting the same fight that we are, it's a comfort for us. 
you know, to know that you know, we're not alone in all of this. You know, and that's what Paul's saying, that they were comforted to know that the church at Thessalonica was still standing in God's word rightly divided. And he says in verse 8, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And it's that encouragement to stand fast in the Word. And when Paul uses that phrase, I want to go to Galatians chapter 5. And this is going to take us back to the things of what Satan tries to affect people with. Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 5, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And he's saying, stand fast in the fact that you've been made free from the law. Don't be entangled again in that law system. And that's one of those things that unfortunately you hear people talk about how you save someone by grace and you keep them walking right by putting them under the law and putting them under a performance system to try to have them do good works. And Paul's saying, that's not what you do. We've been given liberty. We've been made free from the law. Stand fast in the fact that you've been made free from the law. <clears throat> Don't be entangled in that yoke of bondage. Don't fall for that trap. The grace of God's going to teach you how to do the right things and, and not to do the wrong things. You don't need the law to teach you that. Grace can teach you that. You know, stand fast. That's why Paul gives that charge to Timothy about the instruction that's needed for, and this is where we're going to close, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And here we have Paul finishing the last epistle that he wrote, which is actually going to complete the word of God. And it says here, verse 1 of chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And everything that he talks about in Verse 2 of that charge. And then you know, verses, verses three, four, 3 and 4 talk about why he has to give that charge. But verse 2 is the charge. It all revolves around those first three words. Preach the Word. The Word is what's important. You know, if you're preaching the Word, the doctrine's going to come with it. The ability when it says exhort with all long suffering. You know, the doctrine is giving the idea of the, the long suffering. It's giving the exhortation. It's giving the, you know, the idea of reproving and rebuking. That all comes from the idea of the doctrine yeah. is what's doing it. The word of God is what reproves. The word of God is what rebukes. That's why the word at some point when he's telling him about you know stand fast in the Lord. It's standing fast in the Word of God rightly divided that's going to get you through this and it's going to teach you how to live your life according to what God has for you. And on that note we'll open up the floor for questions or comments. Go ahead.